Good morning and welcome to the Cholon Technology Institute. I'm very much excited, um, just as I'm usually excited in any one of these conferences. Every such conference is an experience, and I'm so happy that you came to this conference especially. I'm so happy that Dr. Norina is here as well. And uh, Yuda Meir is a member of the Board of Trustees with his wife. And indeed, I see here a very stable core of people that whom I see every year, year after year. It gladdens my heart. And I'm sure that there are some others who are still on the road, stuck in jams and on the way here. And I'm convinced that this auditorium will fill up. I would like to thank my dear friend, Professor Adir Pridor. We uh, met about 20 years ago, and in our, during our first meeting, um, it, it was actually planned to be sort of a, getting, a meeting to getting to know each other. And we kept talking for about six hours in Beresheva. We didn't even go out for coffee. We were so excited about everything Adir had to you know, told me. And then I suggested to Adir to again join as a member of the executive. And I'm so happy that later he also served as the chair um, of this uh, committee. He's not just the head of the executive committee, he's an active member. And at least once a week for an entire day, we start in the morning, we work till the evening, we plan all kinds of things, we push forward ideas. So the idea to have the series here at the this, you know, a, a conference about um, renowned scientists was Adir's idea. And sometimes, you know, people bring up ideas, and then when it comes to pushing things forward and executing the idea, then they disappear. But Adir, you know, has really executed and pushed things forward, and this has become a traditional series of conferences. And then I ask myself, what is it, you know, the connection between Newton, Archimedes, Alexander von Humboldt, Newton, what is the common denominator? You know, I'm a mathematician just like Adir, and mathematics is not always, you know, a profession. Sometimes it's a diagnosis. You have to understand what connects between all of these scientists. What does it mean that they are renowned? scientists, that they are great scientists. You know, um, you know what Shell again just said, he's, he's the rector. Let me go back to the previous conference. Archimedes was in fact, you know, sorry, he, he lived about 2,000 years ago, and he sort of preceded his time in 2,000 years until Newton actually went and did some of the things that Archimedes did. And when it comes to all these four scientists, they had a great impact, a very important important, um, again, impact on promoting the world, promoting humanity. However, th however, there are some other connecting points between the four. They all contributed greatly and very significantly. And their contribution, again, has been felt for years. Not only so, but they not only contributed to one area, two areas, three, but they contributed to many different areas, to many different fields. I would, we would say that each and one, uh, that each one of them was actually a multidisciplinary scientist, a multi multidisciplinary scientist. That's how we would say it today. Now, our institute also promotes and encourages multidisciplinarism. And the second um, question that must be asked, why is it taking place here in the institute? Why not in some other academic you know, body or institute? Because we believe that the existence of the State of Israel as a technological um, power is based on technology and science and some other things. And we here at the Institute, we had just opened the academic year with um, 1,850 new students. A third of them are excellent students. And we have a wonderful, again, number of students, 5,400 and so um, students all in all. They, again, study electric engineering, but they start off in the Faculty of Sciences that have three amazing departments 
science, the mathematics department, the computer science department. Only in that department this year we accepted about 700 new students. There is an amazing department of physics and the faculty of, again, electronics and electric um, engineering. There are a lot of important things, again, that, are, that promote a lot of the things in industry. And also the other departments of that of physics, again, have promoted, again, many things. Uh, we, we have a design uh, faculty. We're actually physically in the, um, the faculty of, again, um, design. We have all sorts of design departments. Um, and we are actually opening up a new faculty. It's called, um, again, design in technological environments. And we're the, we also have um, learning technologies. It's the only department in Israel. And we also have an, a unique program, which is called Technology and um, Digitization in Medicine, which brings a lot of prestige. And we opened up a new program this year, an MA program in data science. So during COVID, we were all, you know, we all suffered from COVID. We didn't just sit at home. We didn't sit on our laurels. We actually, again, uh, went live. Again, we took 20 different programs. Um, we also uh, received an approval, again, to give, again, a doctor in physics, computer science, mathematics, electric engineering, and um, the industrial sciences. And we also collaborate with our colleagues, with scientists from 130 different universities, from 135 different countries. And a month ago, we opened up our student dormitories, and we already have have students from abroad. 10% of the students who live in our dormitories today are from abroad. It is very important to us that our students, as well as our lecturers, will understand that you have to, again, find that common denominator that connects us all and that we can all aim high together. That is science, those scientists that have contri contributed greatly to our lives. And th so it was in the previous conferences. And this conference as well brings a lot of prestige to the Institute and all those participating will be able to enjoy and to again plan ahead don't come only once come many more times this is a beautiful tradition and it's important for all of us I hope that you enjoy um, yourselves today and lots of luck to everybody so I chose to present Alexander von Humboldt um, in a sort of unconventional way and I would like to uh, present him by means of the following book. It's written here in small font. I'm really sorry because I wanted to present a whole uh, book to you, but you can see again, we're already suspicious about the source of the book. What is written here, this is a, again a memorial for Alexander von Humboldt. Look how it's written, okay? Again, the, the Hebrew spelling is a little funny, it's a little archaic, again, in memory of his birth. And then there is a signature that explains why it's written here. So it's written here, Berlin, with, again, sort of archaic spelling, September 1887. If you remember, sorry, 1857, if you remember what I said before, it is indeed his 88th birthday. And who wrote this? Chaim Zelig Slonimsky. It's written. It's interesting. There's actually a Hebrew book, a Hebrew publication from the middle of the 19th century where it's written as follows. Now, it's difficult for me to read, but I'm so excited. I want to read out to you what is written up there. This is from the book. So there is some sort of a blessing. Um, you know, blessed is he who has given his wisdom to blood and flesh. In Judaism, this is pretty accepted. This is a blessing that is, again, an, um, recited when you see a very wise person. Sorry, they're asking questions from the audience, which we cannot hear. Um, this is usually recited for philosophers. Again, the history of these renowned person are intertwined with the different wisdoms and the sciences which expanded um, over the past 70 years because all his activities and all his deeds um, throughout his life are intertwined um, and filter into those new sciences. Who is that man who placed so much um, efforts into um, promoting these fascinating 
wisdom. It is, it is he and none other. That is why I wish to inform to all those who are so interested in wisdom, and I decided to write it in Hebrew to tell him the history of this very dear man and to bring to light all the wonderful things that he did and to glorify all those wonderful wise persons and philosophers and to glorify this great man who actually um, and I'm writing this in Hebrew because this renowned scientist supported the Israelites and always wished to work for their benefit. And that is why I write words of praise and glorify this wise man in Hebrew. This is the introduction of the, this man, Chaim Zelig Zaliminsky. I don't want to expand too much and dwell upon him, but this is the man who wrote the introductory words I just read. Um, you can see Sokolov said that he was a brilliant man, a brilliant scholar. Um, and he actually met von Humboldt, and he showed him some sort of a device, actually one of the initial computers. Um, and this is a little anecdote that's on there. Um, von Humboldt was so excited, and he was um, by this person. By the way, von Humboldt, again, had a lot of connections also with the king of Prussia, and the king. And von Humboldt wanted to, again, introduce Slominski to the king of Russia. And this is what he said to him. He actually did organize the meeting, and Slominski walked around Berlin to actually look for this uh, uh, sort of respectable sort of coat um, and then to, to meet the king. And then when, when he met von Humboldt, uh, he said, what did you do? I just wanted to present to the king a simple Jew in Jewish attire with payers with a skull cap and you know traditional Jewish clothes. And now you bought this fancy coat. What a shame. <laughs> In any case, this man also got all the awards. He's, um, he is buried in the Warsaw Cemetery. But let's go back to Alexander von Humboldt. I don't want to read um, all this text here on the slide, but just want to point to the fact that he basically tells um, this. Uh, he tells us what Alexander von Humboldt did. And in the middle of the slide, you could see actually, ex you know, sort of expanded the sciences of the earth, which is actually geography. He he taught us about the rivers. Uh, it's called hy hydrography, as is written here in old archaic Hebrew. And let's say further that Humboldt, I don't think there's any other person, there wasn't in history where so many things were named after. So there are things named after him, um, counties in the United States and in other places. I don't want to elaborate on these because I want to get to other things as well, but there are cities named after him, more than 10 cities. Of course, streets in different cities and national parks and uh, mountain ranges all over the world, in New Zealand, in Greenland, in Antarctica, in Nevada, and so forth. Even an iceberg is named after him. There are lakes named after the Humboldt Lake, rivers, Humboldt rivers in a number of places. There are vessels. More than 10 ships are actually called the Humboldt. And he's also named, there are plants named after him. Almost 300 different plant types are named after Humboldt. I may show you maybe a little page later. More than 100 again. Um, organisms are named after him, and these uh, again, these are that cold um, um, ocean uh, um, flow. These even um, on the moon. Um, there's a crater named after him. There's an asteroid. By the way, all the previous asteroids were actually named after mythological figures. He was the first that again, uh, of which again an asteroid was uh, named after him. Of course, there are museums and colleges and uh, very um, famous foundations. Again, all named um, after Humboldt. And the question is why Da Vinci, Archimedes, Newton, why? Uh, 
is he again well, nothing named after them but he was a german a scientist i actually really i actually checked to see if he wasn't an anti anti-semite he actually was a supporter of israel by the way but he was german that was his again um oh, that was only that was his only sin and especially england and and usa and others promoted again during his lifetime they actually promoted the science of science and technology and because he was german somehow again his uh, his name wasn't didn't make headlines so he's not as well known as other scientists but the fact is that his um germans did not give up on him and there is a stamp bearing his figure and then i said i would say a word about his connection with the jewish people it wasn't he was again zionist or pro-jewish but he also dealt with social problems he um fought against slavery he was fearless he met with jefferson president of the united states a few times and it was quite a, quite some impudence he said you are the president of a liberal state how could it be that you have more than 200 slaves on your farms and that's what humboldt said humboldt said that sla slavery goes against nature and in his opinion and maybe it wasn't accurate but he said there's no phenomenon in nature that resembles slavery so there shouldn't be slavery among human beings either so again he was anti-slavery anti-imperialism uh, and my friend uh, Matia Meiser will tell us about it. he'll talk about imperialism a little later on Again, he was a, a very well educated, dealt in many fields. Look, I couldn't even write all the different fields in which he engaged, but look at them on the screen in front of you. And I'm so happy to tell you that we here today, again, are adding geobotanics. He was the first to not only deal with again plants, but by the way, when he came back from his big voyage, um, around again towards the end of the 18th century to South America, he brought samples with him, illustrations, records of about 2,000 new plants that science didn't know of. Again, scientists in Europe that w dealt in botany, again, knew about 6,000 uh, plant types. He added another third to that number, um, to that number of plants that were known in that time. And he sort of located these plants geographically. That was that was the new idea. That was the innovation. He noticed that those plants actually, you know, plant again uh, along isothermal um, lines. And in the middle of that isotherma, again, this was a concept that was invented by Humboldt. And he said something very interesting, that if you find yourself at a certain point and you want to find a certain type of plant life, you have to shift or move according, you know, with uh, those, um, the, the lines, um, those Lillian lines of, of Earth. And if you go up north, in any case, you will be receiving, to, you'll be actually noticing the same types of uh, plants. So these were novel ideas at the time. Let me just show you again these again little stars that I placed here. It's those specific disciplinaries in his work that we will refer to. Um, we will have different types of lectures that will talk about each one of these areas. Uh, Professor Moshe Zuckerman will challenge again those that hold the term clusters that's written up there. Um, and uh, will somebody else talk about ec ecology, botanics, Professor Schmider will give us an interesting presentation on that, which will be a bit controversial. He will criticize some of Humboldt's theories and beliefs, and that's fine. Ethnographics. I might mention something of that. I would like to conclude my um, opening remarks. Each one of those blue signs um, actually opens up to another elaboration about each of these fields, but I will stop here. And I wish all of us a um, very a stormy lightning conference. And you can see this was an illustr uh, a picture that was actually um, created by Humboldt. 
this this photo can be a, a, a motto to um, Humboldt's life view. In German, you call it Naturgemelde, and you know that this word, maybe it's difficult to translate, but it actually means like an illustration of nature, but more so, it is the realization of nature. How does nature realize itself, manifest itself, creating things that uh, that beyond go beyond the eyes? So you see this mountain, which is called the Chimborazo Mountain in Ecuador. Um, it's a volcano. He climbed it, reaching about 6,700 again meters in height. Uh, I think it's again uh, the highest mountain that any human being reached ever. And at the time, they thought that Chimborazo was the highest mountain in the world. It was only later that they actually were able to uh, measure the Everest, and they noticed that the Everest was the highest mountain. And, and lately, you know, in order to do justice, so to speak, that if you measure the height of a mountain, not only, the, again, the height above uh, sea level, but from the center of, uh, of the Earth to the peak, then Chimborazo is still the highest mountain in the world. So this was something interesting because on top of this mountain, he actually drew, maybe you can see this from afar, I don't know if you can actually see it, but we basically put it out there in the lobby. We put it, we enlarged it so that you'll be able to see. So on top of this mountain, he wrote the names of the plants and some life organisms, some um, um, animals and different um, living organisms that he found um, at each point of the mountain. And he wrote tables on each side of the illustration. And according to the height, he elaborated again the, the average uh, air pressure, the altitude, the different organisms, plant life that he found and different things that he measured. He placed it in those tables and he called this entire illustration Beyond the name that he gave, he added a remark, like a subtitle, and he called it, the again, the, the world, the mo microcosmos of the world on one page. And it actually, it's, it's, it's a wonderful expression of who Humboldt was and what his life view was. And um, I might, you know, uh, say a few other remarks throughout the day, but in the meantime, let me give the floor over to somebody else. Thank you so much. Have a very fruitful day.